Order. It's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions. I have to inform members that question two and four have been withdrawn. And I call Mr. David Michael Veen. Mr. Michael Veen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. Minister. Well, the purpose of the Active Aging Strategy is to transform attitudes to and services for older people. It is important that we fully acknowledge the enormous contribution that older people make to our society and that we challenge the negative stereotyping of older people. The strategy, when published, will provide direction for departments' policies, make connections between strategies and lead to the improvement of services for older people. In developing the draft strategy, we have worked closely with the Commissioner for Older People and the Aging Strategy Advisory Group, which includes as uh, members older people and people working for organisations that represent older people. Officials met with the advisory group on the Wednesday, the 25th of February, and plan to hold a workshop later this month to finalise outcomes and work with our statistici statisticians to develop indicators and to discuss the final draft of the strategy, which, once uh, finalised, will be subject to committee consideration and endorsement by the Executive. Subject to this approval, we hope to publish the active aging strategy in the coming weeks. The draft indicators for the strategy, which will establish baselines on current levels of need and be used to monitor the implementation of the strategy, will be issued for public consultation in the near future. Thank you. And I call Mr. McElveen for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer and indeed the vital work that is being done for this group of uh, vulnerable people within our society. I wonder, has any thought been given um, under the Delivering Social Change um, Network to perhaps some sort of a cross departmental signature project that might particularly be, be targeted towards the needs of our older people? Well, I, I, I certainly think that uh, in, in the context of developing uh, an active aid, aging strategy for older people, it, it is incumbent upon all uh, departments to recognise their responsibility and to whatever additionality they can give to supporting uh, older people who deserve to be supported and who have made massive contributions towards both the development of our economy and society down the ages. And I certainly think if the member has any particular ideas or suggestions, both the uh, junior ministers, Jonathan Bell and uh, Jennifer McCann, would be only too happy to speak to him. But I, I certainly think that that cross-cutting uh, work, uh, if uh, it can uh, work to the benefit of older people, in a way that uh, delivers more for them, then I'm sure our department, uh, First Minister myself and the junior ministers, will be very, very supportive of what the member has just said. Uh, I wonder if the First Minister shares my concerns that the fact that clear-up rates for crimes against older people are only 9% when in fact they're 17% for other groups, and meaning that they really have less protection? Well, I certainly would be very concerned about those figures, and I think what that does is place a huge responsibility on all of us, not least the police service, to ensure that we continue to examine ways in which we can support older people, because fear of crime is a big issue for older people, and in all of the dialogue and discussions that there has been with the stakeholders and with the Commissioner for Older People uh, and, and other conversations with older people, this comes through as one of the main areas of concern for them. So I certainly agree with the member that in going forward, uh, we have to look at what more we can do. The police have to look at what more they can do. But I think also there is a huge issue for society in that all of us, police service, want a community sector, local communities, politicians. We all have to be working together to identify what need there is and to see if we can bring solutions. Mr. Speaker, the Deputy First Minister will be aware that on more than one occasion this Assembly, or at least previous Assemblies, has supported the idea of help with um, personal care for our elderly people whenever they need it. Uh, would the Deputy First Minister um, 
bring forward or help to bring forward uh, some idea that would prevent our older people having to sell the roof over their heads to pay for elderly care in their twilight years? Well, I, I certainly think that that has been uh, of concern to uh, a lot of people over the course of uh, recent times. Uh, I think that you know, the, the strategy strategic games, in our view, will improve existing services to ensure that they best meet the needs of older people. And in addition to that, uh, we have worked with departments to tackle the challenges facing older people, and these, these will be taken forward in phases. So, obviously, the issue that the member has identified is a key issue because that engenders concern and fear for the future in the minds of a, a, a lot of older people. And I think that represents one of the further challenges that we have to deal with in the time ahead. And, of course, the conversations that have taken place with the uh, Older People's Commissioner, with the individual stakeholders, which include an awful lot of older people. This issue has uh, been raised, and I certainly do think that we need to look at what more can be done. Ian O'Connor, Mrs. Bronwyn McGahan. But, uh, can I ask the Minister to outline any projects that, that will support the active aging strategy? Well, uh, as I say, I mean, the, the whole purpose of this is to ensure that the strategic uh, uh, aims uh, will improve existing services to ensure that they uh, best meet the needs of older people. And uh, in addition to this, we've worked with the departments regarding projects which will support uh, the active aging strategy to tackle all of the challenges that face uh, our older people. And these will be taken forward in phases. The first phase will involve programs where resources have already been identified to make them happen. And these include things like encouraging and helping the new councils to sign up to the World Health Organization's age-friendly environments program, a project to tackle fuel poverty, affordable warmth, tackling fear of crime, increasing the engagement of older people with policy makers, increasing digital inclusion, and the new uh, mental capacity bill. For the remaining programme proposals, additional resources will be required. So subject to funding being available, they will be prioritised and subsequently form the second phase of the implementation uh, of that uh, particular strategy. Thank you. And I call Ms Megan Fearon. Question three. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister McKeon will answer this question. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions three and eight together. On the 19th of February, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister made a written statement to the Assembly about the programme for government commitment to extend legislation to give legal protection from unfair age discrimination by those providing goods, facilities, and services. The proposed new legislation will apply to people aged 16 and over. The aim of the new legislation is to protect all the people aged 16 and over from discrimination because of their age when accessing goods, facilities and services. And this will put age discrimination outside work on a similar footing to discrimination law and employment. It sends out a clear message that ageist attitudes and practices are as unacceptable in service provision as they are in the workplace. Subject to the executive agreement, we intend to bring forward a consultation document in the near future setting out our proposals on this matter. Following consultation, we will then consider all of the options available to us for bringing this legislation before the Assembly. I call Ms. Megan. Ms. Megan I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, but can I ask the Minister if she would be supportive of future legislation to allow for the inclusion of under 16s in respect of HDFS? Yes, I can tell the member I am most definitely supportive of more inclusive legislation to stop age discrimination and the provision of goods, facilities and services. And we will continue to work with the children's and the young people's sector to progress full extension of age discrimination legislation. The current agreement um, regarding the scope of the legislation now means that where previously no one had protection against age discrimination, we now have those, the, the most advanced legislation on these islands for people aged 16 and over. Again, I call Mr Peter Weir. I thank the junior minister for answers so far. Can the junior minister outline the, time, uh, the timetable for the implementation of such legislation and does she envisage it being implemented in this mandate? 
Well, the member would know that this is a, a programme for government commitment, and we have been working with officials to see. Um, obviously, um, we, we have recently agreed the scope of the legislation, so therefore we are looking to see how we can take that forward. And there will be the consultation period, obviously, um, but we are looking at all possibilities in terms of trying to actually bring the legislation forward in this current mandate. Commissioner Dominic Bradley. Um, the Minister has said that she will consider extending uh, age uh, discrimination provisions to uh, young people under 16 in the future. Can I ask the Minister why she can't do it now? Well, the member would be uh, aware that, that we could get political consensus on, on this issue and that um, uh, I myself would have preferred to be in a position today to say that the age discrimination legislation um, actually involved all ages. But obviously, we, we, we have to remember we are where we are. And the, the main gap in anti discrimination law here that there's no protection at the moment from age discrimination for any age in terms of provision of goods, facilities, and services. So, this really is a move in the, the right direction, it's a move forward. But I would hope, um, as I said in my previous answer, that we could um, work towards getting that legislation in, uh, for, for everyone because I believe that would be a, a better place where we, that we would be in. Here comes Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank the junior minister for update in relation to this issue. And I, I welcome the long overdue progress in relation to legislation to protect people from age discrimination. But uh, and the older persons' parliament, in particular, will uh, welcome this long overdue announcement. But in relation to those who are under 16 that have been in, excluded from the legislation, can I ask the minister what she made of the evidence that was given to the OFM DFM committee that gave assurances that exemptions? could uh, be delivered that should have allowed this legislation to be extended to all ages? Well, I, I can just reiterate my, as my previous answer to the member, and the member would know um, that I have spoken to two um, members uh, in the committee, um, both uh, in the committee and outside the committee, and I wish that I, I was standing here today saying that it was covering all ages. I certainly believe that's, that would have been a better um, piece of legislation, um, particularly in terms of anti-discrimination law. But I will uh, endeavour to work towards um, that we have protected people from, that are over 16, um, or that we will be protecting people from over 16. And at the minute, we don't have anything at all. So this, in my opinion, is a step forward in the right direction. And I hope that, that again, that we will be able to, to see, and I'll be, be here saying that, that it will cover all ages at some stage. Here comes Claire Sugden. Have you changed your mind? Pray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, would the Minister consider that, uh, with regard to age discrimination, that the use of voluntary redundancy and vacancy control may actually discriminate against younger people? And would she undertake, when she's considering legislation in the future, that she might address the imbalance between ages old and ages young? Because this is a serious issue for our society. I'm, I'm not so sure um, what the member means um, in terms of voluntary redundancy. I mean, obviously, voluntary redundancy is just that uh, when you, you're actually taking it because you want to take it. Um, certainly, I mean, uh, we have are in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister responsibility for equality legislation and, and policy on equality issues. So, certainly, I mean, if the member wants to come and discuss this issue with, with um, myself or the other junior minister or indeed the First or Deputy First Minister, you'd be most welcome. Thank you, and I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Try again. <laughs> Supplementary. <laughs> um, th thanks for the minister's question. Five. Okay, question number five. <laughs> With your permission, I'll ask the junior minister McCann to also answer this question. In keeping with the community-based ethos of the Social Investment Fund, Sonal Steering Groups made the final decisions on projects selected for their area plans. Individuals or groups involved with concepts which did not make it into the area plans were advised at the time. The area plans were submitted in February 2013. When the zonal allocations were subsequently announced, the steering groups were asked to prioritise their area plan projects again within their assigned zonal budget. This process was completed by November 2013, and the steering groups should have informed those um, involved of the decisions. 
If anyone is still in doubt, they should contact their zone steering group directly. Um, contact details for these steering groups can be found on the, the NI Direct website. Ms. Ogden, for a supplement. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I think this whole process is actually quite empty, and I think the fact that you're referring us back to a steering group, who obviously know as much as you about this, is quite disappointing. But what I would ask uh, the general minister is: um, Was there actually any money in place when this process was first announced, and is there any money in place to fulfil the applications of the many people who have applied? Yes, uh, I mean, the, and the member would, would uh, know in her own area um, there has been quite a, a bit of progress made in terms of. Um, it, it actually, in those zones, her area would cover three zones, Starry, the Western Zone and the Northern Zone. And there has been about £50 million already committed in terms of letters of offer and projects that have already started. And while the, the, the money is not in the, the baseline of the OFMDFM budget, because it is in fact a, an executive budget, um, there, there's a clear indication that when the money needs to be drawn down, it will be drawn down. And I think in terms of, of the steering groups, um, it it's really is the responsibility of the local steering groups to, um, uh, to if you like, inform the, the, the areas where, or the projects that were unsuccessful. And I think that, that really, you know, um, the, those local steering groups were set up for the purpose to design, first of all, the particular um, projects that they wanted to bring forward. But they also they, they should be actually um, uh, encompass, if you like, members of the community, members of the voluntary sector, and then members of all those other statutory organisations. So uh, there is a clear um, wide membership of those group of those individuals in those steering groups as well. Can I thank the minister for her answers? Can I ask the minister if she could outline uh, the process uh, for ensuring that letters of offer? Uh, to the SAF projects will be taken forward uh, in a timely and an efficient manner? I mean, obviously, as I said, um, there is some projects, and it's good news that the majority of the projects are now progressing, but we are aware that there are also a small number of projects that still haven't reached that full ap approval stage. Officials are refocusing efforts to secure the business case approval on all remaining projects within the allocations for each zone, and steering groups are aware of this. Um, while we have to be sure that all projects are fit for purpose and demonstrate value for money, we remain committed to ensuring that all projects within affordability levels are approved, letters of offer issued and projects are commenced as soon as possible um, in terms of getting the, the benefits from the social investment programme. And again, I just want to say that really, you know, we're working with people, with the, 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 the local steering groups to try and ensure that these, these projects are brought forward as quickly as possible. Thank you, Ms. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think I've ever heard the words uh, timely and e efficient being ever used to subscribe to the Social Investment Fund since it's 30 million underspent as is. And the, min the junior minister only referred to money that has been promised as opposed to actually spent. Could the, min the junior minister outline what the evaluation and monitoring uh, methods are, are, are deployed in relation to the Social Investment Fund? Well, can I first of all say to the member, you're actually wrong because there are projects, there's two projects that have actually started, and they are the Coleraine uh, Rural Urban Network in the Northern Zone and the Bryson Street Surgery in East Belfast. There are a number of projects, and I have, I can give the member a list of many um, of the projects who will be taking work forward soon. Um, and can I say again, you know, that while this money has not been um, in the baseline of OFM, DFM, this money has been allocated, and there's been almost uh, up to £50 million pounds worth um, will be, um, has been allocated in terms of letters of offer and everything else. So I, I, I think it's quite a disingenuous of the member to say that. Um, well, I mean, I just think that, that, that and, and if, I mean, if you want to, uh, uh, the, the whole sort of plan of it and, and how it has been rolled out, I'd certainly give that to the member in written form. It's very far from an order to interrupt the minister in the middle of an answer, and I won't tolerate that. Ms. Sandra Overend. Um, I thank, thank you very much, Mr. De uh, Speaker. Um, as a junior minister, aware that you know, in my area, the applicants didn't even know that there was such a thing as a steering group, or to even know who to go and contact them. But I'd like to ask the junior minister, uh, what would she, what would she say are the key things say uh, that they have learned about the roll up roll out of the social investment fund? 
Well, can I say to the member, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, different sort of areas must have different um, ways of working the steering groups. I know that, that some of the steering groups that I would be, you know, you know, in West Belfast and indeed the South Eastern Zone, I mean, those steering groups are made up, as I said, by members of the local community, by members of the, some voluntary organisations, some statutory organisations, and indeed, once the projects were actually clear on what projects wanted to be brought forward, that they actually um, would have been bringing in then members from the, the statutory groups of the business community on, on whichever projects we, which actually they wanted to deliver. So I think that, that really, I mean, they work close on the ground. And not only do they work close on the ground in terms of the steering group working together, they also work very close on the ground with other um, uh, policies and, and other uh, programs like neighbourhood renewal, for instance, or uh, people that are involved in community planning within the council. So I think that, that, that you know, um, those are local people who are designing the projects for their local area, and the makeup of those uh, steering groups should obviously be from, from the local um, areas. Declan McAleer. question six. Uh, the development of 10 shared educational campuses is one of the seven headline actions announced alongside Together Building a United Community. Uh, the program was launched by the Department of Education in January 2014, and 16 applications were received under the first call for expressions of interest. In July 2014, the first three projects uh, to be supported were announced as shared STEM and sixth form facilities in St Mary's High School, Limavari and Limavari High School, a shared education campus incorporating Moy Regional Controlled Primary School and St John's Primary School, Moy, a shared education campus incorporating Ballycastle High School and Cross and Passion College, Ballycastle. Project boards for these three schemes have been established and detailed economic appraisals, including technical feasibility studies, are underway. Exact costs will not be known until the appraisals have been successfully uh, completed. Uh, a second call for expressions of interest opened on the 1st of October 2014 with a deadline for submissions of 30th of January 2015. And a further six proposals involving more than 20 schools have been received in response to this second call. The expressions of interest received are as follows. Marmount Shared uh, Sports Facility, IQ Centre, North Belfast, Brookborough Shared Education Campus, Digital Dairy, Dunin and Money Nick Partners in Learning, and Cookstown Seed Centre. The first four of these projects were unsuccessful onto the first call and have reapplied for the second call. So these applications are now being assessed, and it's hoped to announce the successful projects onto the second tranche in uh, June 2015. Thank you, Mr. McAleer, for supplement. Uh, I uh, thank the Minister for his answer. I wonder, could the Minister provide us with a progress update on the Listenelli Shared Educational Campus in Oma? Yeah, well, the, the Listenelli Shared Education Campus programme uh, is, as many people know, additional to the Together Building a United Community commitment of 10 shared campuses included in the headline actions. And I can report that very good progress has been made. The first phase of uh, construction, uh, our Valley uh, School and Resource Centre is expected to commence within the current financial year with the school becoming fully operational in September 2016. And work is also continuing to develop the overall exemplar campus design and prepare uh, the wider site. The Lissanelli Shared Education Campus uh, is uh, additional to the uh, Together Building United Community Commitment and is mentioned within the strategy in the context of enhancing overall shared education provision through the creation of the 10 shared campuses which are to be based on the Lissanelli model. And there are six schools in total relocating to the Lissanelli Shared Education Campus and they are the Ar Valley School and Resource Centre, Christian Brothers Grammar School, uh, Loretto Grammar School, Oma Academy, Oma High School and Sacred Heart College. So this is a, a, a totemic project. It is one that has generated huge interest within uh, uh, County Tyrone and more widely afield. And I know a lot of people are looking at it very, very carefully. And I think that in the course of the Stormont House negotiations, which the First Minister and I and others were involved in, 
the fact that this project uh, was in the pipeline uh, greatly assisted us in achieving the, uh, the half a billion uh, that we've achieved in terms of uh, using that for support for both integrated and shared education. You then call Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Speaker, I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for his answer, and I don't disagree with a single syllable of it. But given the seriousness of the situation and the fact that not a single peace wall has been dismantled and paramilitaries are still flourishing, does this shared campus experiment, is it sufficiently funded and will it really encourage the peace and reconciliation which the people in 1998 voted for? Well, I think that there is a very strong view in, in the executive and indeed among the parties that negotiated the Stormont House Agreement that the achievement of the 500 million, half a billion pounds to bring our young people together in shared educational campuses and to support integrated education is a very worthwhile project as we continue to build for the future. Uh, and I think clearly there are, on an ongoing basis, uh, examples of how people are making a an effort to come together. I know that there is a considerable discussion taking place between officials from the Department of Justice and people on either side of the horrid so-called peace walls uh, that exist in Belfast to see if we can uh, continue to meet the target that we've set ourselves in terms of bringing those peace walls down. And I think what is absolutely essential to all of that is the leadership shown in this assembly and between political parties. Uh, and I think that uh, I described the Stormont House Agreement as an opportunity for a, f a, 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 a fresh start. Uh, and I think what we all need to do is seize this opportunity so that we can continue to build confidence in the political process and between communities. Uh, and I, if I might say, it, even during the course of this conversation, uh, I warmly welcome the fact that the uh, Loyalist uh, Londonderry Bands Forum uh, will this weekend make a presentation to the Sinn Féin, Ardèche and Derry City. And I think all of that represents uh, a big effort being made by people on all sides to uh, you know, see what unites us as opposed to what divides us. And I think that the sort of leadership being shown in the city of Derry is something that could be followed everywhere. Again, I'll call Mr. Chris Little. Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank the Deputy First Minister for his response. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister what level and type of shared contact will occur between pupils in shared education of this kind? Well, I, I think, I think uh, essentially the opportunities for uh, shared education right across uh, all of the work that schools are involved in is clearly there for all of us to see. Uh, and I think the, the fact that the uh, Lissanelli campus, for example, is seen as a totemic project which has been looked at by schools all over the north of Ireland and indeed further afield, clearly shows that people recognise that there are opportunities to bring people together, not just in the context of uh, sixth form lessons, but the more people are brought onto shared sites, then the level of uh, contact uh, uh, will, will be something like we have never seen in the past. Uh, a real opportunity to have people working together, sharing uh, facilities, sharing restaurant facilities, canteen facilities, sporting facilities. Um, myself and the First Minister recently met with people from uh, Brookborough and County Fermanagh. Uh, and, and I have to say it was inspirational listening to the sort of leadership that they're given. Uh, the recognition that they uh, understand uh, given to these projects, uh, which will hugely benefit uh, our young people in all sorts of ways, through their education, through sport, through drama, through arts, and a whole range of issues. And of course, key to all of it is leadership being given in these institutions. And I think there is leadership being given in these institutions. People recognise the value of bringing our people together, uh, ensuring that we, uh, as much as we possibly can, within the challenges that we face, continue to integrate our young people with a view to ensuring that that will pay dividends in the future in terms of moving forward to a much more peaceful and less divided society. 
McGill, and that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mrs. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister. Does he expect, as part of his trip to the US on St. Patrick's Day, to be seeking to promote Northern Ireland as a good place to invest? Well, I, I have been uh, very privileged in, in this job, going back to whenever the DUP and Sinn Féin first agreed with others to go into government together in 2007, uh, to, to, to work on how we can develop as a central plank of our economy uh, the, the attraction of foreign direct investment here to the north. Uh, myself and the late uh, Reverend Ian Paisley had a very successful visit uh, in the course of uh, December 2007. And since then, I have worked very closely with the First Minister, uh, Peter Robinson, all over the United States of America. And in the course of that work, we have managed, even against the backdrop of a very cruel uh, world economic recession, to attract more foreign direct investment jobs to the north than at any other time in the history of the state. So quite clearly in the United States uh, there is an open door for us, whether it be in California, whether it be in Chicago, whether it be in New York or Washington. And the fact that we had uh, during the course of our stewardship of OFM DFM a very important economic investment conference right in the State Department uh, and from which flowed many of the new job announcements that we're now seeing on a very regular basis. Uh, I do believe that we will continue with a very positive message and against the success of the Stormont House Agreement uh, make it absolutely clear to everybody that we are open for business and I think also in the context of the debate around corporation tax it's quite obvious to all of us that there are great opportunities as well as challenges which lie ahead. Tail for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and actually, Deputy First Minister, you anticipated part of my supplementary in that, in that the sooner the, do you agree that the sooner we have the devaluation of corporation tax and a rate at which it will be set, that that will be sooner, that will be better for Invest and I and the executive to attract more jobs to Northern Ireland? Well, I certainly do agree, and the First Minister and I have been involved in discussions around that. It will also be discussed during the course of the party leaders' implementation uh, meetings. But when you consider the sort of access that we have in going to the United States, actually meeting with President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden and others, you can clearly see that there is incredible interest in the ongoing success of the peace process here, but also tremendous interest in supporting economic development here. And I think in the course of our conversations, we recognize that Invest NI have a very important job to do and we need to give it as much support as we possibly can and that does mean as quickly as possible uh, coming to uh, an agreement on uh, time frames and on the rate that we strike. Of course in the meantime we have to await the finalisation of the legislation going through the House of Commons but I am confident that uh, in the decisions that have to be made that, that they will be made in a very expedient way with a view to ensuring that we garner as much opportunity as we possibly can. Good. And call Mr. David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, does the Deputy First Minister believe that improvements could be made in the executive in affording more protections to faith communities within Northern Ireland? Well, I, I do think that there are tremendous protections for faith communities in, in the north of Ireland, and, and I have a, a tremendous respect for all of the churches and the contributions that they have made through what has been a very challenging time for us in terms of the, uh, the political process and also the tremendous work that the churches do in bringing people together. Uh, I do think that the, the point that he has mentioned is obviously uh, has some currency in relation to the ongoing discussions that are taking place at the moment and I understand there was a, an important meeting between the uh, Bishop of Down and Connor and the DUP uh, last week. Uh, it was quite interesting that there was also a meeting between myself and the Bishop of Down and Connor a week before that. So obviously the churches have uh, a very great interest in meeting with uh, politicians. Uh, and I do think that uh, what we have to do is ensure uh, as we go forward that we have a very uh, fine balance 
between the rights of faith communities and minorities within our society because a chief responsibility of this assembly and the executive is to ensure that as we go forward we protect the rights of everyone, that there is equality for everyone, whilst at the same time not denying anyone the right to practice their faith. And call Mr. Michael Veen for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I do thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer and also welcome the fact of his church attendance in the last couple of weeks as well. Um, I wonder, could the Deputy First Minister um, just give us some indication, bearing in mind, as he makes the point, that faith is not just reserved for Christian community, but also obviously is, is, is broader. Um, would the Deputy First Minister have any objections to faith, the issue of, of protection and rights of, of, of people of faith to be included in the commission that was recommended by the Stormont House Agreement. Would the Deputy First Minister have any objections um, to that being part of it? Well, I think it's a bit bizarre the, the member mentioning my attendance at church in the course of recent times. I'm a regular church attender and uh, sometimes I go there with the First Minister and indeed others when the occasion demands. So I, I have a huge respect for all churches. Uh, and of course, as someone who is a Catholic, I try to be the best Catholic that I possibly can be. Uh, at the same time, during the course of the Stormont House negotiations, the purpose of the commission which we've agreed was to deal with the whole issue of flags and symbols and emblems. And I think that that would be stretching uh, the remit. Although I certainly would be open to conversations during the course of the party leaders uh, meeting around the issue that uh, the member has just raised. Uh, and I know that he uh, ha <coughs> is very close to his own faith. Uh, I know so, some people who are very close to him also, and he knows that I know them, and he knows that I have a great admiration and respect for them, even though they come from a, a completely different uh, religious position from myself. So I think what we all have to do is uh, we have to respect each other. We have to recognize that uh, the whole issue of uh, religion can be very divisive and uh, very damaging to our society. And all we have to look at, you know, is further afield of as what is happening in other parts of the world, the atrocious activities of groups like ISIS uh, and the way in which they target religions of all descriptions and, and carry out mass murder in order to get their own way. So uh, hopefully we are a society here. We are, hopefully we are a society that is uh, emerging successfully from conflict. And I think the vast majority of the members, with the exceptions of maybe one in this house, uh, sing from the same hymn, hymn sheet as I do in this. And to any guess the last time that I am going to warn members, if you interrupt a minister in the middle of an answer, that is you're preventing everybody else from hearing the answer, I will take action. I hope that is as clear as it can be. I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I should be grateful if the Deputy First Minister could update the House on the progress of development at Shackleton Barracks, Ballycally. Yes, well, I'm very delighted to be able to say that the Minister of Agriculture and uh, Rural Development and myself were, were in Ballycally less than uh, two weeks ago uh, with the local community, with representatives of all of the political parties, Ulster Unionists. Uh, DUP, SDLP, and Sinn Féin. Uh, I'm not sure if there were any Alliance members there, but there probably, there probably was. And we were there for the purposes of, of uh, viewing the ongoing de demolition of uh, military buildings on the site so that we can uh, begin the process of relocating an entire government department, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, to the Ballykelly site. The Ballykelly site, when it first came into our ownership, uh, many people thought you know, it would be a hindrance to the executive and in terms of maintaining the site would actually cost us money, and it did cost us some initial funds at the beginning, but I believe funds well spent. This is a site twice the size of May's Long Cash, and the First Minister and I have been involved in uh, a number of people among a group of something like 40 expressions of interest who wish to go onto that site. And we are absolutely confident that we can create thousands of new jobs on the Ballykelly site, which will be a major boost for people in Derry City, in Limavady, and the Coleraine area, not to mention 
Ballykelly itself. So the whole of County Derry and, and wider afield will benefit uh, through the development of that site. So uh, it's a very encouraging message, it's a very optimistic message, uh, and I do, do believe it will be a success. And comes to Cree for supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that. Um, I was there recently with the CAL committee having a look around, and uh, I must say I was surprised at the number of buildings that there are. Uh, and all sorts of conditions. I'm just wondering if any of those buildings are anticipated to be retained, Deputy First Minister? Y yes, I, I do believe that some of them will be uh, uh, retained and, and indeed refurbished. And uh, already, ev even as we speak, uh, as I said, the First Minister and I were speaking to people who are looking to take, take out a short-term lease over the course of this year for the next nine months. They have a project ready to go. Uh, and without breaking the confidentiality of that, it's a very exciting project indeed. And for that to work for them requires the utilisation of some of the buildings on the site. Now, Mr. George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as well as the relocation of Dard headquarters jobs to Ballykelly, can the Deputy First Minister outline the potential number of jobs that could be created by private investment on the Ballykelly? 740-acre site? Well, it's always hard to know when a member gets up to ask a question what the question is going to be, but in the case of the member for East London Derry, uh, it was highly predictable that it would be about Bally Kelly. Uh, and I know he has a, a tremendous interest in the development of this site and the interest of people in the uh, constituency. And uh, from that point of view, we sing from the same hymn sheet. We are absolutely confident that apart from the relocating of the department headquarters for DARD to the site and the interest by NA Water, who are also interested in a project on the site, that much of the other expressions of interest do come from private companies, some of them indeed from overseas. And uh, I think even at this stage we can predict you know, that when fully developed on that site, th there will be thousands of new jobs. And, you know, God knows where I'll be 10 years from now, but I think people will remember uh, the decision to use the site to, uh, in, in the course of the next short while, see what level of interest there is in terms of how we sell the lots off on the site. And as a member has said, it's an absolutely massive site. So we can predict that, site, that site will be very successfully exploited for the purposes of putting our people into work. And a quick supplementary, Mr. Robinson. Thank, thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Would the Deputy First Minister agree that political parties opposing any redevelopment of the Ballykelly site could be damaging to the whole Northwest economic future? Well, I mean, I, I, I was surprised when I heard that, that some reservations were, were being expressed. And I, I'm not going to use this as a party political point score and exercise, except to say that this is a wonderful site that there are tremendous opportunities before us, and the First Minister and I are absolutely determined, we are absolutely determined that we're going to exploit the development of this site for the benefit of uh, development business, uh, bringing in foreign direct investment, and putting our people into work. And, and that will be a massive benefit to the whole of County Derry, as I call it, or County London Derry, as you call it. Um, I've Mr. Alistair Ross, I, I'm afraid I don't have enough time for the supplementary, but you only put your question and could give you an answer to your first question. So be as succinct as I can, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this morning the First Minister outlined uh, the new names and functions of a smaller uh, executive, which will be good for efficiency and also in terms of saving money. Reform within the public sector is also underway. Would the Deputy First Minister agree it's now time that we act in making the Assembly smaller by reducing the number of Assembly members? And does he see any reason why that couldn't be done by 2016? Well, I, I do think that we have an agreement. It is a Stormont House agreement, and it is to deal with the reduction of the number of MLAs by 2021, which is the election after 2016. Uh, speaking personally, uh, no difficulty at all uh, with the reductions, except to say that because it was uh, uh, part of the Good Friday agreement, and that didn't change during the course of the discussions on the St Andrews agreement, the reality is that we would require the support of all the parties who signed up for the Good Friday Agreement and uh, who supported the Good Friday Agreement and the referendum. 
and I know that you know, reservations about the speed of all this have been expressed by both the uh, Ulster Unionist Party and uh, the SDLP. So I think this, this is a matter which essentially will have to be processed through the party leaders' uh, meeting. Uh, and, and I think that we're determined to, uh, to deal with the issue, but it has to be in a way that brings everybody on board. Thank you very much, Minister. That uh, brings us to the end of question time. To the